Hello, everyone, and welcome to McGill Cares, a weekly web series addressing a wide variety of topics to support family and informal caregivers. I'm Claire Webster, a former caregiver who became a certified owl consultant and founder of the McGill University Dementia Education Program. I work with a dynamic team leading healthcare professionals to oversee this program, which includes Dr. Joseph from the Division of Geriatric Medicine, Dr. Serge Gauthier, McGill University Research Center for Studies, Dr. Gerald Freed, McGill Steinberg Center for Simulation and Interactive Learning. These webcasts are made possible thanks to the generosity of our donors, and today's webcast is made possible thanks to the Zeller Family Foundation. I'm very excited because we will be discussing former caregivers become advocates for Alzheimer's research. You know, when you get touched by a disease, there are times when either you can move towards the illness and really become part of it and want to make a change. And there are other times where people just, once the illness is over, they decide that, you know, the journey is over. But today I get to interview two of my very, very good friends and fellow crusaders who have been devoting their lives towards making a change in the field of Alzheimer's research. Mrs. Dorothy Reitman is a respected lifelong activist and community volunteer who was appointed to the Order of Canada in 1997. She cared for her late husband, Cyril, who died of Alzheimer's disease in 2014. Mrs. Reitman currently serves as a board member for several organizations, including the Cummings Jewish for Seniors Foundation, and serves as co-chair Alzheimer's Research for a Cure at the Montreal Jewish General Hospital Foundation. Mr. André Charon is a vice president and portfolio manager at an investment management firm who lost his father to Alzheimer's disease in 2011. He and his family have given generously to the Jewish General Hospital Foundation in honor of his father. Mr. Charon sits on the board of directors at the Jewish General Hospital Foundation and is vice chair of its $250 million capital campaign. Both Mr. Charon and Mrs. Reitman are ambassadors of the McGill Dementia Education Program. Welcome to our show. Thank you. So, Thank you. Looking at what's happening right now with the situation with COVID and all the families that are impacted by it, especially those who are caring for loved ones with dementia, what are your thoughts on what's been taking place? Andre, you want to start? Well, right now we're uh, uh, in a uh, very particular uh, uh, health situation, not only here, but across the world. And uh, the, uh, the research for uh, Alzheimer's uh, is still going on. But I mean, right now to, to, to find funding, uh, the proper funding to create uh, proper research and then uh, results uh, is sort of uh, held back by the, uh, the, the COVID-19 issue, which is, uh, I guess, uh, generating a huge deficit all across the world, whether it's Canada, the US, and we're talking trillions of dollars. Uh, somebody eventually will have to pay for this. But first, uh, this is, we, we're talking money. And meanwhile, the COVID issue, we're talking health. I mean, the first thing you wanna have in life is your health. No matter what age you are at, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, that's why we're, uh, looking for research and uh, research is uh, essential. Uh, unfortunately, for many years, uh, the uh, Alzheimer's issue has been swept under the rug saying, well, it's a normal disease. People are getting old, uh, you know, they're getting senile and everything else, but no research has had been done unless uh, then ever since I've been involved with the George General, I've seen, hey, these guys are doing something about it. I'll jump in, you know, with pleasure. Dorothy, so Dorothy, looking at what's happening, thank you, Andre. Dorothy, if looking what's happening today at all the people, um, perhaps you can share a bit of your personal journey with your husband and really led you also to become very involved in research. Well, first of all, Claire, I really want to tell you that you have been a highlight of my advocacy career. Well, and as far as the coronavirus is concerned, um, 
we are testing, we are hoping to test older people. And that is the same thing with Alzheimer's. So we've been sort of held back in our clinical research. But let me start with the background so we can go in order. <laughs> About 15 years ago, my husband, Cyril, who was normally a very organized and efficient person, began showing symptoms of dementia. He was losing his phone and his keys and getting very confused. And um, as a family, we agreed that we needed to find a solution. And so we went to, together to the memory clinic at the Jewish General Hospital, where he was thoroughly researched and, and examined. And finally, they uh, said that he had Alzheimer's disease. You know, at the time I knew nothing about Alzheimer's. Uh, it, it really had its stigma, so people didn't talk about it. And so really, uh, we were hoping that we, they would give us a pill that would cure it. But to our horror, we found out that there was no cure, there was no prevention, and that was the problem. But not to worry, they had good neurologists. But nobody at the time told me what was to come. So I walked away thinking, well, you know, we're lucky uh, because we'll just continue this way. I didn't know that the disease was going to deteriorate as it did. So I want to stop and you there because you just said, so at the time, nobody told me. So even back then, you were not provided with any information no. about the disease, how to prepare no. yourself, nothing. Exactly. Nothing. Yeah. And... Uh, the disease actually, it, it's different than regular dementia because it spreads through the brain and slowly each part of the body gets uh, paralyzed by losing its memory. It's not always that I don't recognize you. It's because, for example, my husband lost his mobility and then he became aphasic. And you know, that was something that certainly I or my family could not manage alone. And so the family insisted that we hire a caregiver. And we were very fortunate that we were able to do that because we soon needed caregivers 24 seven and the cost became astronomical. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we realized the value of the caregivers we couldn't do without it. I worried about what was gonna happen in the community uh, because the t statistics were horrendous. In, in 2011, they were saying that there were 700,000 700, people who were get, being diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And they predicted that in the year 2031, there would be a million uh, and four, hundred thousand million people who would have the disease. I mean, this is a, a tsunami. I, I mean, it's terrible. What were we going to do? In the meantime, in Toronto, my son Joel was in contact with the Mount Sinai Hospital and Dr. Joel Sadowitz, who was director of geriatrics there, and they set up a program for carers called the Reitman Carer Program. And yeah, it was I very- hear about that, definitely. Yeah. I wanna hear about that. I'm gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna wait because I wanna hear about that program. Sure. Um, Andre, how about you? Can you tell us about like your father? When was the first, like what made, what were the first signs in your father? And like, what made you believe that there was something wrong? Well, if I go back, uh, I'll be br sort of brief because uh, I, could, I could write a book on the whole, the whole issue here. Uh, about 2004, 2005, I could see my father, who was a, a, a finance uh, icon you know, in his own field. Uh, he had a su superb career in the uh, investment dealing business, and he was a man in control. And uh, he obviously... Uh, I f he was repeating himself on many issues all the time. That's, why is he repeating this to me? I, I know it's okay, but I wouldn't say it to him. And then I, I sort of felt that he was like turning around uh, in circles and circles, and always uh, 
picking on the same subject, the same topic. I didn't, at that time, what's, what's wrong with him? I wouldn't say it to him because he was a proud man and he wouldn't, I mean, he would not accept. Had he knew that he had Alzheimer's, he didn't want to know because he was in control. He liked to be in control of his things. And uh, there's many, many uh, examples I could give. Uh, you know, like he would turn around the, uh, like his tax account, for example. That's just an example out of many. Uh, for, for years, he would say, was that paid? Yes. Yes, that was paid. Yes. So it's, a, it's the same bill that you, we paid two years ago. Yeah, and then I said, there's something wrong with him now. Very, very, very wrong. And then we had him checked out by a neurologist. Uh, to prepare the uh, ineptitude mandate mm -hmm. because he he had control over a lot of uh, a lot of assets, family mm -hmm. assets, and uh, we were scared. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we worked that out. And uh, but still, he would insist. He was like insistent on everything. And I I read at one point uh, every Saturday morning, if I recall the. Uh, uh, the, the paper, uh, the Globe and Mail in Toronto had an article uh, on, as a, a weekend, you know, issue. Uh, people that were uh, giving their experience as uh, people that had somebody close to them that had Alzheimer's disease, and you had many different stories, very different. Although they, mm -hmm. they, they all had the the same common traits, yeah. and it was very interesting to read these things. Uh, they were you know, online, so I could read them. And I said, well, I could identify, I could myself in, and my family, close family, we could identify ourselves as the patient because uh, my dad didn't know what was going on. But we were you given, saw, were you given, were you given any information upon diagnosis finally? No, were you given not really. Any information well, about what it was and how to take care of him? And well, we were told to, uh, I mean, we went through, I don't know how many caretakers at one point from night, from 2006. Uh, and then when we had him move into a, a home uh, in Utamao here, a well, you know, well to do place. And from April, 2009, we had to get people to take care of him because the people there, obviously like, it's the same problem we have today in the CLSC and everything else. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough qualified people. Mm -hmm. The people that were there did what they could with what they had, period. Mm -hmm. I admire what they did, but it was not enough. Yeah. And to deal with an Alzheimer person, yeah. uh, 24 hours a day is, is unbearable. To be quite frank, I, I went, I visited my dad at uh, you know, at the at the home, l'image du Tremont, uh, every week, if not twice a week, three times a week, and I walked out of there after an hour with him. I was tired. I mean, I was yeah. Yeah. mentally yeah. drained. Physically. And so I talking, so talking about had the impact on you. So Dorothy, um, you know, you mentioned that when you know when when he was diagnosed, there was yourself, there was your son. So what was the impact on you and your family, this diagnosis? You know, here's this man that is such a pillar of your family. How did his diagnosis impact you and your son? Well, as I said to you earlier, we didn't know the, the future of the disease. We were rather naive. And uh, so the impact was shocked that we didn't have something to treat him with. To make him well, and that we had to hire uh, caregivers. We were fortunate that our caregivers were excellent, but um, I think that there is a comparison with the present virus and the problem that we saw with the, the lack of caregiving uh, and how it makes how important it is. And so it was at that point that um, we became concerned, I became concerned too, about the need for taking care of caregivers because most caregivers are family members. Mm -hmm. And that was where the Reitman Center uh, played a very important role. And it made a great impression on me. And so when I came back to Montreal, I looked for similar groups and we tried to set up groups and 
um, Claire, you remember the Alzheimer's group, mm -hmm. which was a group of people like us who had the same kind of problems and who were doing support programs. And then as a member of the Cummings Center, uh, we were very concerned because a large part of our membership were Alzheimer's victims. And so today we have a whole series of programs going on at the Cummings Center, which I'm very proud about. But I still feel that this is an ongoing problem and a problem that really has to be addressed properly. We have to educate the community so that they, they're willing to get involved. And we have to remember that statistic of 1.4 million people being diagnosed in, by 2031. I think we have to change that number. So, Andre, yeah, thank you. Andre, I wanted to ask you, um, at, at what point, you know, along your journey, did you decide that you wanted to become like an advocate for change, that you wanted to get involved in research? Well, it's very simple. Uh, yeah. When I saw the, uh, in 2009, when we, we hired extra people at, at Limage du Tremont from the outside, and there were uh, three shifts a day of eight hours to take care of my father, to make sure he wouldn't fall and uh, he wouldn't, you know, wash himself. He would take care of himself properly because the, the vigil at the, on the second floor where he was living, uh, he, he, there were 22 rooms there. I mean, obviously the poor guy couldn't, you know, supervise everything. So, and I saw the cost of this, I said, wow. Mm -hmm. We were fortunate to be able to That's afford right. this, mm -hmm. very fortunate. And I said, what about the, you know, uh, the, the average earner, uh, wage earner? What, what's he going to do? I mean, he, he won't be able to, I said, let's get on with research. Yeah. And obviously my experience, uh, my father was taken to the uh, following a fall, well, he was taken to the emergency room at obviously the Jewish Ger General. And I spent at least uh, three nights there with him uh, in the corridor. And, uh, and he was treated A1 by the, the Jewish general people. I mean, I could see how they worked. I was there, you know, and I saw the, uh, the way they were sending up. I mean, at the emergency, you never know who and what you're going to get at all times mm -hmm. of the day. Mm -hmm. And my father was taken care of there three times. And then I said, that's enough. Uh, we need people to help him, to make sure that he doesn't fall again. Okay. So we hired these people, but at a very high cost. Uh, really generating my interest to say, hey, let's do something about this. And then I got involved with uh, Dr. Andrea Leblanc and then uh, Dr. Howard Churkow of the Jewish General. And, and that's when uh, the two of you started working together, both on the board. That's when we started working together. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and with Dorothy, uh, and uh, we still get together at times when we and uh, talk about the yeah. whole thing, the whole issue. But right now, it's we're in a bit of a standby. You know, mm -hmm. let's get the fund, but where from? But to, to, to finish with one of the, 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 the caretakers, or I mean, capital, especially for an Alzheimer's patients, to take care, to, to, to play with them. And it's not easy. The people we hired were, I mean, angels. And uh, all three of them were at my father's funeral. I mean, that was a, a sign of, uh, and they, they had seen, they had been there before, you know, and uh, we felt comfortable. And those caretakers uh, were uh, like, a, uh, for us, was like, uh, you know, a not a holiday, but we can sleep tight. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get a phone call at four in the morning saying your father's going to emergency. He fell. We don't know what he has. He probably has a broken neck. You never know. Yeah. The person is lying there. He doesn't know if he's hurting. He doesn't yeah. know anything. You know, it's, Dorothy, it's scary. Yeah. Dorothy, you want to tell him thing? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Andre, you have described exactly what motivated me. I became strongly concerned that we needed to get rid of this disease. It was the only solution. And so I went back to the memory clinic and I told them of my, my mission. And they directed me to the Jewish General Hospital Foundation where I was greeted by Meyer Bick, the director at that time. 
and who set up appointments for me with the different researchers at the Lady Davis Institute. I met with them all and it was amazing. I didn't know that research was going on, but when I met Andrea LeBlanc, she gave a very logical presentation. And it was then that I decided that we should support her. And Andre came in at that time, thank goodness. And uh, away we went. Uh, she, she did uh, a basic research on Alzheimer's, which she, she found an enzyme in the brain that she found was the thing that was causing the Alzheimer's. And she figured out that if she removed that enzyme, that it would prevent the disease from happening and it would cure it uh, while it was happening. And, and of course, her research was on mice. It went on for several years and um, Andre was very involved in helping fund it. Thank you, Andre. Mm -hmm. And she came out with a big success. She had a drug that was gonna prevent and cure Alzheimer's disease. And this was very exciting, but now we had to test on humans. And that's where we are at this point. And that's called clinical research. And we had to move out of the Jewish hospital uh, because we had to go into clinical, which was a whole different thing. And Andrea is a McGill scientist and um, it was interesting because we worked together with the Montreal Neurological Institute, also a McGill program. And we had Dr. Evans worked with us and they have the most magnificent brain center there. Yes. And they even had a, an imaging program in which they were able to help Andrea to find, to identify the enzyme in the brain. This was very important because how would you know without mm -hmm. looking for it, an enzyme, and that's not a bone. Uh, so there we were, and we had to set up a whole new endeavor called an entrepreneurship in which uh, we would raise the money. Uh, part of it is philanthropic, and the other part is venture. And that means that we're looking for people who maybe want to invest in this drug. And if it's successful, they will make money. If it fails, they will lose. And or philanthropy, give money and get an income tax receipt. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, the problem was uh, that there were a lot of obstacles in the way. Mm -hmm. We had to hire lawyers because you need a patent. And there are all kinds right. of regulations that you have to pass uh, before you are able to start testing the drug. You have to be able to access the drug. And all this is not simple. I mean, you and I cannot go and, with our goodwill as volunteers yeah. and do it. You have to have skilled people. And that yeah. costs money and time. And now we're hoping to restart, hoping that the phase two of the COVID goes down and we're waiting. As I say, we don't know what's going to be in the future, no, but no, no. hopefully yeah. McGill will be involved in a successful research project. Yeah. And to do this, Claire, we have to educate our community. I hope we no longer have people that go through the experience that Andre and I did in not knowing what was going to happen. And I hope, and I congratulate you for doing this program, that we make every effort to spread the word around and to, in the meantime, set up programs to help and to know that we are going to be successful in research and hope that our government will kick in too because it's in their interest to not to have this kind of terrible expense in front of them. They'll be yeah, happy. I know, I, know how much you, I know how much you've devoted to this. We've had how many coffees and, uh, and Nick's and <laughs> amazing. I want to give for, because I have a few more questions for the two of you and looking at the time, I want to 
to give uh, Andre a chance to talk about also now, what are some of the initiatives that you're currently involved with? And then Dorothy, I'd like to hear about the, your program in Toronto, okay? Because how you're supporting caregivers. So Andre, okay. talk to us about what you're involved with now. Okay, here it goes. Um, ever since my involvement with the Jewish General and uh, Dr. LeBlanc's uh, research department, the fundamental research, uh, my family has uh, created a chair, a research chair at uh, l'Institut Armand Frappier in Laval, uh, which is an institution that my father helped finance uh, many years ago. So I've taken the, uh, the, the torch and uh, moved it, and I was given the chance to open a, um, a research chair there with a great team. Uh, and also, I've been involved with the, as uh, Dorothy was mentioning, the neuro which is also uh, supervised by McGill. Uh, like this project that we're doing is supervised by McGill, which is a great, great institution. And uh, we don't have to uh, brag about their uh, merits as far as the uh, uh, medical issue. Uh, and their in uh, in instruction and uh, education. And uh, I was involved with Dr. Uh, Evans. I was involved right now with, I'm with the uh, doc, Dr. Louis Collins, who is basically a, a, a he's a doctor, but a brain engineer. Like I'm not a I'm not a scientist for any means, and I feel <laughs> I, I get great a great benefit, a personal benefit that I ha I can look into what what the medical uh, aspects are, and uh, like, and then I I got involved with the, the neuro. And which is a uh, it's a form of a screening. They can screen millions of brains all across the world. I mean, it's easy to get the information now. Mm. And at what age would somebody be touched by Alzheimer's? They have samples. They have everything. And in the meantime, I was approached for some reason by uh, uh, L'Hôpital uh, uh, Saint Justin for a donation. I said, "Well." I'm involved in knowing full well that uh, Up Saint Justin is catering for kids, you know, children, lower age children, like under 20 and, and so on. And I said, well, I, I don't want to, I'm more involved with the Alzheimer's issue I, for now. Uh, we'll talk later. And, I, and then he said, well, you should talk to this doctor here, Dr. Michaud. Um, Michaud. And it was, he's involved with the, uh, uh, the uh, he can tell that before birth, mm -hmm. he can look into uh, the, the the fetus and say, "Well, maybe." Oh, obviously, he's not going to say this kid, whoever he is, is going to have Alzheimer's, but he, they can detect from birth till they're That's twenty. Amazing. This the brain at this from at that period from birth mm -hmm. till uh, late uh, teenagers. It grows so fast, and then they can detect that maybe those they could do. So they will do testings with people uh, to say, well, maybe he would have eventually a neurodegenerative mm -hmm. issue, mm -hmm. which is Alzheimer's, ALS, uh, Parkinson's, and uh, you know, uh, sclerosis, uh, uh, multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. These are like, they're all interrelated in a sense, because it's all related to the brain, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. And Alzheimer's mm -hmm. is one of them. And mm -hmm. uh, should we find something for Alzheimer's, I wish I just pray to God that we will. Mm -hmm. uh, this is going to connect with other, you know, I mean, Parkinson's is horrible also. It, you know, uh, multiple sclerosis is horrible. They're all bad, bad, bad uh, mm -hmm. situations. Mm -hmm. uh, medical situation for the families and uh, uh, so I I've sort of made a life cycle uh, research program starting from death going back to birth and then I, I have my people and I uh, I'm involved with at least five different even including the, uh, uh, the Douglas Hospital mm -hmm. and they have a program there to uh, develop uh, and help people that are hit with Alzheimer's with a virtual uh, mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. I, I, they, they made me do it too. I mean, I, I went there physically. Now I can't because of the COVID, but uh, I do I do those those tests with them. It's very interesting what they do. And I personally, uh, uh, I was just 
useless in, in science in school, but now I get to learn yeah. without <laughs> having to pass exams. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's like my second education, and I, that's, that, it's one of the reasons I want to get involved. And also, as uh, Dorothy was explaining, the, the, the horrible cost uh, for a lot of people to, uh, to make themselves more comfortable to live with a, I mean, uh, somebody that is hit with Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and their family to take care of them. I mean, uh, we've seen some horror stories. People, well, what are we going to do with uh, Uncle uh, Ernie? Uh, what, what the hell are we going to do with him this weekend? Well, put him in a home. And first thing, you know, these homes sometimes are, you know, uh, not up to par. And uh, you, you get those obviously isolated incidents that people that run away and uh, are found frozen in, in a snowbank. You know, well, I, I've seen that. I've read about this. Yeah. We yeah. talked about this, Claire. Once. Yeah, we did. We did. The two of yeah. you, thank goodness I have you. Because <laughs> we saw that. I mean, that's we can talk obvious. about that. So I have to, I have to move on day, to the next but one. It's probably. Okay. <laughs> Dorothy, um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the program in Toronto, um, the Reitman Center, because actually I had the great privilege of going and visiting with Dr. Savoy, Dr. Jose Morin, and I did a special trip to see with the great work that's being done. So how are you supporting caregivers in Toronto? Talk to us about it. I will. But before I begin, I want to thank Andre for reminding me to tell you that the Alzheimer's disease can be familial as well as spontaneous. In our case, it's familial, which means that my husband had three relatives before him that had the disease. And therefore, what motivates me is that I must prevent the disease from affecting the rest of my family, my husband, my grandsons, you know. Uh, and I think that's a very important thing. It's interesting how they were examining embryos. In any case, the Reitman Carer Center is very unique because technically when they started, they had actors and actresses putting on skits and role plays of the problems that Alzheimer's patients present. And then they would have uh, invited members of families with Alzheimer's or caregivers to react what they would do. And there would be a discussion. And during that period, they would learn how to deal with their patient, how to respond, what to do. And um, the program became very, very successful. We even have a program for working people that you referred to, because how do people go to work and take care of their family at the same time? And um, the program in Ontario uh, has really been dynamic. It's been an example for many other communities across the country. And the Ontario government became involved in Ontario and they have spread the program around the province. And I thought that that was very unique. I'm going to create a, a link program on the McGill resources page for people to look at. So that way, the, for those people living in Ontario, um, that they'll you. be able to have access and see. I will make sure to create a link after this webcast. Um, yeah. I also want to mention that the, um, you know, Andre, you've been very, very uh, supportive of the McGill Dementia Education Program is now going to be developing an, an entire new innovative online education program so that we could educate family caregivers around the world. You know, Wonderful. now that we, especially during this time of COVID, I mean, prior to COVID, we wanted to make sure to educate as reach as many people as possible, you know, from their homes, because it's difficult for caregivers to leave a family member and go attend workshops in classrooms or in other places. So, yeah. you know, thank you, Andre, for your, your contribution. And we're going to be, we're, we're launching that program and it's very, very exciting. So I have one final question um, to you both. Um, and so we'll start with Andre, really, you know, so people who are watching today are just starting this journey. Uh, you know, what would you say to those family members who are just beginning the journey with, with their loved ones who, who got a diagnosis of dementia? Well, um, uh, every case is different. I mean, every family uh, has different ways of living. Uh, it's uh, if you have somebody that is being diagnosed, which is easier now to get the results, you know, you see a neurologist, you can tell, well, 
there's something wrong with this person. He's not what he used to be. Uh, there's something wrong. You go get treated, I mean, or get a, a, a medical opinion. Uh, see a neurologist. A neurologist. Uh, these these people are special. I mean, they're it's their specialty. Although they might not know that uh, what exactly causes Alzheimer's, because it it could be it it could differ from countries to countries, uh, ways of living. What would you say to the caregiver though? The person caring. What advice would you offer the person caring for the, for the, the loved one? Uh, uh, it's um, that there are programs coming out now. I mean, if some obviously uh, I did it personally, I found it, I burnt myself, you know, to understand and try to help. Uh, it became a, a, a burnout issue almost. Mm -hmm. Some of these caretakers, they, mm -hmm. they, they don't stick around too long. They, you know, they, they try it and then they, they move up. Then you have to replace them. And sometimes the relation between the caretaker and the, the patient has to be top top, or else they don't last. I mean, they, it, it is a very very a very uh, hard question to answer. Uh, every case is different, but yeah. I mean, so the whole basically program, what you're saying is that we're supporting. Yeah. Yeah. This is what you know people yeah. have, and they're 18, 20, 22, 23. They're still doing their undergrad studies at McGill, for example. They could have those courses which will be supervised by Miguel to get the proper what to do with a person that has Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yeah. to get the basics, fundamentals of how to treat that, how to deal with it, how to deal with your whole family's involved. I mean, uh, you, you can't be selfish about it. That's say, oh, you take care of him this weekend. No, 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 no. Everybody's got to find a way. And uh, if, you know, you're going to be taking care of him and, and with time, uh, the, I, I really, I truly believe in that program to develop new uh, competences. I mean, new uh, ways of helping the elderly. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm still involved with the geriatric issue at at, uh, at the Jewish General, and who help uh, people with, you know, dementia, Alzheimer's, and they give them goals. They they have a, a an artistic program. You know, they, they have a goal. They wake up in the morning and they can work their minds. There's many ways, uh, uh, crossword puzzles, uh, painting. Uh, you should see the, uh, if you walk to the, uh, the, the, the Cape Pavilion, uh, the, 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 the work of arts of these people that are in the, the dementia program uh, that was uh, led by Dr. Uh, Ari, uh, uh, Beauchet, and, uh, which have helped uh, for a couple of years now. And his wife has taken care of the artistic issue. And they go, uh, these people in other hospitals also, they go to uh, the Musée des Beaux-Arts and uh, have a show. Yeah. So it's, it's, there's many ways. Don't let yourself, yeah. Don't let yourself go on and on. Don't let yourself burn out and yeah. your loved ones as busy as possible. Dorothy, what would you say to them? Well, I think Andre has described what we need. And that is, I would suggest to people just being diagnosed to get themselves involved in a support group, to look for support because it's the support that brings you to all the programs that Andre has just been describing. Because mm -hmm. you're not gonna know it if you don't make the contact. And yeah. there are support groups and I think that they should go for them. And I think that we should um, advise other uh, memory clinics or doctors that there are those support groups and to tell their patients where to go. I know that you, but one of the organizations that you're involved with, the Coming Center, has some excellent, excellent um, programs yeah. as well. And we'll be leaving a link uh, to that as well. So, yes. um, uh, that's all the time that I have today. So I wanted to thank you so much for the two of you for coming on. And like, please, let's all the three of us will keep crusading together. Um, <laughs> here, here. You know, and, you know, <laughs> I hope we keep working together. Um, so please join us uh, next week, Wednesday, October 14th. And a very important topic will be 
navigating and accessing important resources from the Quebec Health and Social Service Network. That's a topic that most people have no idea how to navigate the healthcare system. And I'm going to be having my guest, Zelda Freitas, who's a graduate of the McGill University School of Social Work. She has 29 years of experience in delivering services to older adults and caregivers. She's the core of the developing practices and, and supportive caregivers of the CIUS, West Central Montreal Center for Research and Expertise in Social Gerontology. Um, this webcast is an initiative of the McGill Dementia Education Program, which is funded by private donations. And um, once again, I thank the Zeller Family Foundation for supporting today's webcast. If you would like to make a donation or contribution to our program, please visit us at mcgill.ca slash dementia. And if you have specific topics or questions that you would like us to address during our weekly webcast, email us at dementia at mcgill.ca. Until next week, take good care of yourselves and your loved ones. Thank you for tuning in.